Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, challenges facing our correction system, the latest on the controversial Enbridge Line 3 pipeline project, issues surrounding legalizing marijuana, and the Senate's newest member. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. 2018 was a difficult year for Minnesota correctional facilities with the deaths of two corrections officers and assaults of several others. Joining me to talk about the challenges facing the Department of Corrections is the agency's new commissioner, Paul Schnell. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. There is a bill in the legislature right now that would increase staff for Minnesota correctional facilities. Is it simply a matter of needing more staff or is it more complicated than additional state support? It, it is more complicated, it always is, unfortunately, but um, I think there definitely is a need for more staff. We, we have to bolster, uh, as, as over, the, over the course of time, there's been a, an increase in programming, and that one of the things that people need to understand is that everything happens in a, that happens in a prison requires staff to do it, security staff to do it. So if you move um, fr uh, inmates from one cell block to a program, they have to be escorted by staff. And so all of these activities require staffing, and, and oftentimes that we have not kept up as well uh, in terms of providing that. So the educational part of, of those that are incarcerated, the training, the movement about, is really a logistical issue that requires people. It, this is all people, okay. uh, and it requires people to escort them, make sure. You know, we have the number of people that are going out every day for different medical appointments to specialists that we are constitutionally obligated to provide. It takes two staff people to do all of those. So it's a complex issue around staffing. Um, we also have issues around our starting pay compared to, for instance, county jails. Uh, a starting officer in the, in the state, a uh, correctional officer, uh, it would be uh, three to four dollars less than a comparably paid um, uh, correctional officer that might go to a county jail, uh, really in almost anywhere. So competition, and in light of the fact that we have a, a worker shortage already, people are maybe not as inclined to work in these in these facilities. Ac ab absolutely, and I think, you know, so pay becomes one of the consideration, and certainly is uh, on the table is something we need to look at. Well, one thing I want to talk about, there was an opinion in the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder written by Antonio Williams, who is an inmate at Rush City Correctional Facility. In his opinion, it's not about staffing, but there's a lack of accountability among correctional officers and overcrowding that are contributing to some of the unsafe conditions. He writes about how uh, inmates write a kite, and it can be about needing medical attention or other things, but it can also be a complaint, and then the officers that read the complaint might be the ones that the person is complaining about. So there's a conflict of interest there. Does he have a point? So certainly I think one of the things that we need to do when, you, when, when we already have a stress system and then we, we um, try and create, uh, have staff that are really fair and balanced in their approach, and I think for the most part they are, but oftentimes this can become a problem. Um, Overcrowding is definitely an issue. We, we, none of our facilities are really built for double bunking, and yet we double bunk in a number of them. So one of the objectives of, of the Department of Corrections has to be to reduce our population without an impact on public safety. And there are things that can be done to address that. Criminal justice reform? Uh, criminal justice reform as one of them, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but on top of that, I think this whole issue of the kites, the way they communicate about cr concerns, questions, or even grievances, is something that we need to look at internally. Um, and while the, it's not necessarily going to go directly to the person that they may have had the problem with, but oftentimes it's somebody who is closely aligned. And so we need to make sure that there is a level of transparency. And one of the one of the proposals that has been bantered about during this, will be bantered about during this session, is the return of, a, of an ombudsman for corrections to, to provide a mechanism for people to air those grievances. One other aspect I'd like to touch on, how serious is the problem of people being incarcerated who have addiction issues or are suffering from other kinds of mental health conditions in terms of the safety of the prison environment? Well, I, we can't underestimate the, the impact around mental health issues in particular um, are profound. And they're, uh, as you know, affecting education, public safety, 
um, virtually every single segment of state and local government is being influenced by this. And I think we have to look at that. Now, we, while we know um, people with mental illnesses are not necessarily more dangerous than the general population, the reality is inside of a correctional facility, unaddressed issues, when we're, when we're packing people in or confining people like Right, when there's overcrowding like and that creates stress and stress leads to mental health yep, explosions. And, that, that, and that's, <laughs> yeah. this is part of the thing that we need to look at. So what, what we ultimately want to do is make sure that the people that we have in our prisons are the people who absolutely need to be there, number one, and number two, that our interventions are effective and make a difference going forward. In a statement released upon your appointment, you said, quote, I am equally ready to build coalitions to make Minnesota's correctional system a national model in fairness, efficiency, and outcome. What kinds of coalitions, what is your vision? Well, I think for me, one of the things that has to happen is that, first of all, I, I really would like um, corrections to become a Main Street issue. You know, I think it's easy for us to forget about this. You know, these, these people who uh, commit acts of wrongdoing or engage in things that that uh, we've defined as, as being illegal. Um, so I, I want people to care first. Second of all, the coalition really has to be, it has to be crime victims groups have to have a voice. Crime victims advocacy groups, the people that are pushing for reforms, they have to have a place and a voice. Um, we have to make sure that inmates have a voice. We have to make sure our staff have a voice. And these, this is just, it's hard work. Um, we can we, we can no longer, we spend massive amounts of money, and most of this money that, that comes into Department of Corrections is general fund money. And the reality is that we have to be effective in how we use it, responsible stewards of, of, that, of those dollars, and make sure that we're really engaging everyone around the table. Commissioner Paul Schnell, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. This week, the Walls administration authorized the Commerce Department to continue appealing the decision by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission to allow a certificate of need for the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline replacement project. In a statement, Governor Walls said, By continuing that process, our administration will raise the Department of Commerce's concerns to the court in hopes of gaining further clarity for all involved. As I often say, projects like these don't only need a building permit to go forward, they also need a social permit. Our administration has met with groups on all sides of this issue, and Minnesotans deserve clarity. Republican lawmakers gathered on the steps of the Minnesota Senate building to respond to the governor's decision. Frankly, Governor Walsh, on this issue, you're not listening. This is an issue that we've had a lot of conversation about. It needs to go forward, and there's a lot of people that are very upset that this process is continuing to delay and delay and delay. I, I'm always going to be looking for a win-win with the governor. This is a lose-lose. It's a lose for the environment. It's not uh, going to be environmentally good to have an old pipeline in there when we could have had a new one. And it's a lose for our construction workers that are looking forward to these jobs. Uh, this was Governor Wall's first test on what one Minnesota means. Um, and in this example, I think very clearly Governor Walls has failed the test. Um, this was an opportunity to side with Minnesotans, uh, to side with jobs, to side with the science, uh, to side with uh, local governments who are looking forward to the property tax revenue, um, and Governor uh, Walls chose to side with extreme environmentalists. Also this week, Majority Leader Gazelka set forth the principles that will guide his caucus as lawmakers craft the state's next two-year budget. Uh, four pillars that we're looking at uh, about what we want to do and how we want to do it. And so the first one is caring for people. We want to make sure that uh, when, when we're looking at the things that we're doing, that it shows that we care for people. So that's your seniors and, and looking at the age wave coming and, and many people needing long-term care. It's children, it's people with disabilities, uh, people that uh, know, need to know that Minnesota cares for them. The second one is uh, protecting the taxpayer. Uh, we want to make sure that as we're uh, re releasing uh, bills and, and looking at overall budget that we've protected the taxpayers. We want to co control spending and hold government accountable. And so it sort of dovetails into the, the second one that I mentioned, mentioned, but how do we hold government accountable? And so that's where we're looking at, are we looking at reforms? 
Are we doing anything that bends spending curves? Are we addressing waste, fraud, and abuse? And finally, we want to show and say that we want to be, this to be a transparent process and so that we want to know that this process is transparent so you're aware of what's happening and that we're committed to getting done on time. A ballot initiative to legalize recreational marijuana passed in Michigan last November, making that the 10th state in the nation and the first in the Midwest. Here in Minnesota, a measure to authorize the recreational use of marijuana has garnered bipartisan support. Joining me to talk more about it is Senator Melissa Franzen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. At the press conference where you and Representative Mike Freiberg uh, announced this proposal, it seemed that you don't necessarily expect it to pass this session, but you believe that the conversation needs to start. Why? Well, because I think Minnesotans are ready to have this discussion. It's like you mentioned, other states have had this discussion, and even just north of us, the country of Canada had just passed legalization. So it's time for us to figure out uh, what our path will be, um, how we would tackle this if we are to go in this direction. Um, if it's inevitable, um, we'll see what happens at the federal level. But I think Minnesotans are ready to learn more about this issue. So there's a lot of parts to this, uh, the issue of legalizing marijuana. Senator Julie Rosen, who in the Senate is championing uh, measures to tackle opioid abuse, has said that legalizing marijuana is a move in the opposite direction. Senator Chamberlain said that THC is poison for the brain. Considering the number of people who struggle with addiction, is legalizing marijuana, which is addictive or can be addictive, is, is it the right way to go? Well, I think the right way to go is to start having that discussion and really um, separate what's real from what's not in terms of, of the science and the research that has been done so far. There are states and, and there are places that have done research that uh, opiate addiction actually lo is, lo is lowered in states that have legalized. Uh, we should bring all this information to a committee hearing and really tackle all those questions that people have. Uh, whether it's a, a good direction or, or, or it's not for the state, I think we need to have those discussions and bring that information forward to, for us to really know what to, what to really, um, what to direction we want to go. When you talk to people on the other side of the aisle, but actually this actually isn't partisan, it doesn't mm -hmm. break down to Republicans and Democrats, but when you're talking to people who are a no, what are they, are they open, are they a no, are these conversations happening now that you've brought this forward? They are, and they've always been happening. Um, listen, after the press conference a week later, I had less than 100 emails coming through, mostly in favor of them. About 33 of them were in favor, 22 were against it, and the biggest issues were uh, gateway drug, um, addiction, um, impairment. Uh, so we're going to look into uh, those those areas and, and really find out if this is, if this is indeed uh, does all the things and uh, the harm that people say. I mean, we're not saying it's a good uh, drug to use. In our press conference, uh, our Republican co-author, uh, Dr. Jensen, talked about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that because it's legal, it's it's good for you. Um, same thing with alcohol, same thing with tobacco. Uh, so we have to, a lot to learn from those things, and we just actually made it easier to, to purchase um, both of them in, in terms of e-cigarettes and, and Sunday liquor sales. So we, we have to really look into how, how, how to responsibly regulate uh, this particular drug in Minnesota. Well, and you talk about alcohol, you talk about cigarettes. What message does potentially legalizing marijuana send to kids? We give them the message to make responsible choices, and yet now we would maybe be giving them legal access to something that many consider an irresponsible choice. Well, the, the bill is 21 and older, so it, they wouldn't be considered kids. They'll be adults right. to be, be able to legally purchase it. Part of the bill also tackles education, particularly for young adults, to make sure that they know what are the risks. Right now, they're consuming a product they have no idea where it came from. It's not been regulated. They have no idea what the dosage is or, or the potency. So we want to make sure that when we do this, that we have funding to be able to, to make sure that people are, are educated and that we um, restrict access to children. And certainly, um, it, it's continue to uh, uphold the Indoor Air Act and, and the freedom to breathe that we have in Minnesota. So it wouldn't be for public use in a park. It would be um, certainly more restrictive than that. Let's turn to, uh, you mentioned Dr. Jensen, Senator Scott Jensen, one of the Senate's two physician doctors. He spoke at the press conference about how many of his patients could benefit from using marijuana from a medicinal standpoint um, for chronic pain or anxiety or, or other things which currently are not allowed for medicinal cannabis. 
would just expanding the the kinds of, of ailments that a person can have for medicinal use of marijuana be one way of going at this? And there is. Um, we have expanded the use in Minnesota as recently as the last few months. Uh, we added more um, ailments to it. Um, again, we have an opioid crisis, and we, we have to recognize that. Is medicinal cannabis an area where we can actually uh, take people away from opioid addiction and, and recovery? Um, can it be used as a tool? I think we have to have both. I think we, we certainly need to enhance and our, our, our um, a medical uh, cannabis program, but also the recreational piece has a part in, in lowering costs there as well and access. Uh, if marijuana were to become legal, how would the state remedy those who have criminal records due to its former illegality? A big part of the of the bill is expungements and making sure that we um, have a restore of justice and racial justice component and equity into the bill, acknowledging that the communities that have been hurt the most by the war on drugs has been uh, have been communities of color. So we purposely have that language and looking forward to getting input to making sure it works for uh, the AG's office and the criminal justice system and, and public safety. We want public safety to be part of this discussion and be a partner in ensuring that um, we're not jeopardizing our public safety if we legal. Um, cannabis in Minnesota. Are you hearing objections from those categories that you were just talking about, the criminal justice system or the law enforcement? Are they objecting or are they coming to the table? Uh, not yet. So we haven't had a hearing. I'm certainly reaching out and I, I'm, I'm certainly um, having conversations on my own, uh, but the organizations, I think it, the bill is, is very, um, it's a starting point of a conversation. It, it hits all the buckets that we, we think are important to legalize, to have a legal framework in Minnesota, and, and we welcome um, everyone who is affected, will be affected, and all the stakeholders to help us draft the best bill that we can for Minnesota and learn from other states who have already done so. So is your, is your goal then just more conversation this session? I assume the House maybe will have a hearing, but do you expect one in the Senate? Well, um, I didn't expect to pass medical cannabis as quickly as we did. We did it in, in a few weeks at the end of session um, back in 2013, I believe. So you never know in the political process, but as, uh, we, I think we deserve um, to have this conversation uh, started as soon as possible so we can, again, make sure we have the best components of a good framework for Minnesota and a responsible one. Senator Franzen, I want to thank you. Thank you. I recently talked with two lawmakers who opposed the measure. As a state, as a, as a conservative, as a libertarian type leaning guy, yeah, it'd be nice to do as much, have as much freedom as possible, but in the state government role, we have a responsibility to, I believe, allow people to be, do good things, do what we can to allow them to do good things and prevent the bad things from happening. This is, people running around talking about uh, hands-free, protecting p people in public safety. We don't like smoking. Why in the planet, why in the world would we say marijuana should be legal now when we're concerned about smoking? THC, marijuana is poison, it's bad for you, it destroys minds and it destroys lives. I do not support legalization of recreational marijuana. It is currently illegal on the federal level and so that would be one pretty good reason why I wouldn't want to support it. Number two, uh, I generally support law enforcement and law enforcement has told me that uh, uh, recreational marijuana is going to be a public safety hazard. We've got all kinds of laws that we try and keep people off the roads um, when uh, they've been drinking. I simply can't see legalizing another product that will put somebody on the road that perhaps uh, is going to create another safety hazard. Also this week, lawmakers announced a plan to create a farm to school program. This is a whole win-win situation for our schools, our, our farmers, and most importantly, our kids. Uh, gives them an opportunity uh, at child care providers, child care centers, and our schools to get fresh farm produce from our local farmers. I like this, fruits and vegetables. I like eating good food from farmers. I want all kids in Minneapolis to eat l healthy lunches like I have. This farm to school bill will also benefit local economies. Every dollar invested in farm to school generates $2.16 in local economic impact. The dollars in this bill will be injected right back 
into our neighborhoods, keeping farmers on the farm, keeping their children in our schools, and circulating dollars through the local community. And a proposal to increase the numbers of indigenous teachers and teachers of color. The 2019 Increased Teacher of Color Act is a comprehensive bill that will strengthen uh, existing programs that we know work. It will establish new programs. It will increase accountability and it will make significant strategic investments to increase teacher of color, teachers of color and American Indian teachers in the state of Minnesota. We know that when our educators reflect the diversity of our students, we will truly be much more successful in narrowing our persistent achievement and opportunity gaps that are among the worst in the country. Out of almost 900,000 students attending the schools today, 300,000 of those students are students of color and American Indian students. That's almost 30% of the student population. In Minnesota, there are approximately 64,000 teachers teaching in public schools, but only 2,700 of those teachers are teachers of color or American Indian teachers. And I think this issue really is a bipartisan issue. I was the co-author of the bill last year. And it's important to me because uh, as somebody that was adopted, I was born in Columbia, and somebody that was adopted, I grew up in kind of a suburban uh, middle class uh, family, and I didn't really connect with my ethnicity uh, like many uh, students of color. They never see a teacher of color. Governor Tim Wall's appointment of Tony Lorre to lead the Department of Human Services created a vacancy in District 11, representing communities in Carleton, Kennebec, Pine, and St. Louis counties. Representative Jason Rarick won the contest, and now Senator Rarick joins me in the studio. Congratulations and welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. You are a lifelong resident of your district and an active member of your community. While campaigning for this seat, what did you hear most frequently from your constituents? Um, I think some of the things they talked about the most was uh, funding our transportation needs, uh, broadband access, and people working together at the Capitol. So uh, those are all things that I'm going to work hard on trying to do this year. Well, and speaking of broadband, um, you, you have said repeatedly that that is something that's very important to you. Mm -hmm. What is going to be the best way to increase access, internet access across the state? Yeah, you know, I think some of the things that I've worked on is working with the grant program and trying to make it so that a township or a city that doesn't have access can file and apply for the grant without a provider and then once they get the grant reach out to a provider and then the other thing that I was working on with uh, Senator Lori was uh, making it so that uh, bonding money is allowed to be used for the infrastructure. We believe it's the same thing as roads and bridges, so uh, if we could accomplish that, I think that would do wonders for getting some of that uh, backbone infrastructure in place. So efforts that you'll champion now that you're in the Senate. Yeah. You've served two terms in the House of Representatives, so you have lawmaking experience. What have you learned about the lawmaking process? Uh, you know, it's uh, something that is a little more involved than you generally think of in just watching from the outside, uh, there's a long process a lot of times. Things you might think are so easy to get through. Uh, getting through the committee process, uh, getting things drafted, and then getting a consensus uh, takes a little bit of time. And a lot of times it maybe takes uh, two or three years to get something through, maybe even longer. Uh, but you know, you have to work with people, get to know uh, the chairs, get to know people from both sides of the aisle, and work, work it that way and build consensus to be able to get something through. Well, that is a common complaint, how long things take. Is that something that you find you have to talk to your constituents about, like just understanding that it is a long process? Yeah, you know, sometimes you just try to explain that, that, you know, they believe something should get taken care of right now, and you have to explain that, yeah, it, there's a process involved, and uh, sometimes that's you think that's a bad thing, but uh, the unintended consequences sometimes, if you rush something through, end up hurting you more than they do help you. So uh, it's sometimes very good that the process is slow, too. Is it true that you had lawn signs while you were campaigning for the Senate that said, I'm an electrician, not a politician? 
And uh, is that true? Yes. So uh, I, just, I believe it said, elect an electrician, not oh, a politician. Okay. Um, that's the slogan I took up right from the beginning uh, when I first ran. And uh, it was my background in the electrical uh, field and being I still work as an electrician. Um, that I came up with that slogan and I still believe that uh, being a politician is kind of a frame of mind uh, doing things based on getting reelected rather than doing what's right so that's why I still say I'm an electrician not a politician. So with that in mind the Democratic Party has traditionally been the party of tradespeople. Is that changing? You were endorsed by a handful of unions. Uh, you know, I believe a lot of people in the trades are, it's very much like the area that I come from. They don't, they used to affiliate very closely with the Democrats, um, and they're starting to see a little bit of a change there from the party. And so they're not identifying closely with one or the other. Um, and so they're looking at the, the candidate themselves. And uh, so I've worked very closely with the, the unions, especially the trade unions, in my four years here, and they've really appreciated that I bring that perspective to the Republican Party, and it's kind of the same thing in my district as well. They, they don't affiliate close to one or the other, so they appreciate that uh, I have that perspective and the working perspective and can bring that to the Capitol. Yeah, and it, it, it's historically been a unique perspective for a Republican. Uh, Tony Lorre preceded you in the seat, and before him it was his mother. Um, so the Senate has been represented by D.F. Fellers in your district for quite some time. Is, is it changing a little bit? You're talking about tradespeople, you know, not necessarily affiliating one way or another. Across the board, is it maybe changing a little bit? You know, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a change in the rural areas, but I think it's more, um, Republicans have been putting up uh, some very good candidates in their rural areas that identify very well. Um, I look at uh, representatives like Dan Fabian and Deb Keel. Um, you know, they're just so well known and fit their district so well and I guess I believe that's why I um, ran uh, when I was approached and asked to run and that was why I decided to run because I felt I just I could identify with the people of the district and they would be able to identify with me and I think that's more why we're seeing the change. The Duluth News Tribune posted a link to your election night gathering um, at which you said we are going to stop everything that they think they are going to push through in the House. So upon your election, now the GOP majority is, is 35, 30, 32, thank you. I'm trying to do the math. Um, so it's a little bit stronger here, but the House is DFL, the governor is DFL. If anything will get done, it will require compromise. Where are areas for compromise in your view? Um, you know, when I made the comment, I was kind of looking at their top 10, 12 bills that they put out there, uh, things that our side just is saying that's a little little too far to the left. And so I think, you know, especially with the budget, um, I think we're going to have to look at things and I'm hoping with the Senate side we can come with the approach, you know, let's streamline some of the things we're doing. Let's find the waste and the fraud that's happening. We've seen the legislative auditor come out with some reports that it does show that it's out there so that we can prioritize the things that are important. Senator Rarick, welcome to the Senate and thank you. Thank you. Us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.